Hello again, friends. And you are our friends. And welcome back to another edition of Jim Cornette's Drive Thru, right here, wherever it is that you are at home. What room are you in on this beautiful Monday? Perhaps it's the morning on the West Coast or the afternoon here on the East Coast. I am the great Brian Last, your host, the man who will be asking your questions, which are sent a number of times and a number of ways to corny drive through at gmail.com or on Twitter using the hashtag corny drive through to this man, the star of the drive through, Mr. Jim Cornette. You know, first of all, it's never in morning in any time zone when you get this program up, Brian Last, maybe in Bolivia somewhere, but don't flatter yourself. And oh, secondly, secondly, I am upset today. I know you find it hard to believe that a cheerful, gregarious fellow like myself could be upset, but I'm upset today. People have let me down. I can't believe it. It's the cult of Cornette. The cult of Cornette members, the listeners out there, have let me down, Brian. I'm so hurt. I'm, 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 I'm cut to the quick, stabbed to the core because of this, because of this betrayal. You know what I did, Brian? I did it right here on the experience just a few days ago. One time, one time I asked for a favor because normally I'm a, I'm a benevolent man. I'm a caring man. I get the merchandise out to the cult of Cornette, uh, Cornette's collectibles customers as quickly as possible. I ship shit as swiftly as shit can be shipped. But on one occasion, because of the deluge of orders from the new listeners, from the old listeners, I made the mistake of promoting something on my website. I won't mention the name of the website here or anything that's on sale therein because I don't want to cause further panic. But I made the mistake of plugging that. I made a mistake of plugging that. And, and, the, and the orders came in and have deluged my mental and physical well-being was at, 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 at risk. And I, I asked the people, I said, please have pity. Have pity and please don't send me any more money. Please don't, for, for just for one week, please just don't send me any more money. Don't order anything else. I can't handle this. I'm going to go out of my mind. I'm, I'm going to go out. I'm going to go crazy. I'm going to go out on a limb somewhere. I'm deluged. So just have pity. Give me some relief just for a week. And do you know what those people did, Brian? They, they said, Oh no, no, we're going to pour it on Jim Cornette. We've got you down. Now we're going to put the boots to you. We're going to leave you broken and laying in a gutter, a physical and mental wreck, twitching in a straitjacket because we won't stop. And we know how committed you are, Jim Cornette, to providing high quality merchandise at incredibly cheap prices. And we know how committed you are to providing fast service to the customers. And as a result of that, we're going to give you a nervous breakdown. And they ordered more. And they sent me more money. And I'm going out of my mind. You, the cruel, the cruelty, the cruelty with the cruelness and malice of forethought in your bodies have once again deluged over the weekend that unnamed website with orders for that merchandise that I will not mention simply because it's the best deal you're ever going to get. Thinking of only yourselves, putting your, your own entertainment and edification and enlightenment ahead of my well-being, thinking only of yourselves in this time of trial and global pandemic, you've swamped me again. So here's... I said before, for the past few weeks, it's been so hectic. I'm three to five days behind, or I'm five to seven days behind. Guess what it's going to be now, Brian? It's going to be like a lottery. You're never going to know when you're going to get your shit. It may take two days. <laughs> no, it, it may take two days. It may take two weeks, because we've had to institute a completely different operation here at Castle Cornet. Because before... Every, every, you know, in Christmas time, I'm working on it every day, right? But in normal circumstances, every couple of days, I compile all the orders. I get all that merchandise. I fill all those, and I keep it turned over that way in groups of two or three days. So everybody is getting their, 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 their purchases on a regular basis. 
But now we've had to set up an assembly line. I've, I had to, to read up on Henry Ford. And now if you order just a T-shirt, you go in one stack. If you order just one, a, a Night of Legends DVD, oh, I don't mean to mention that that's on sale again because that's what started this whole thing. If you just ordered one of those, those specific DVDs, you go in another pile. And, I, and I'll spend the day doing books or one day doing T-shirts or a day doing... Cult of Cornet membership certificates. I don't want to mention that either because there's so many new Cult of Cornet members. But anyway, and and then I'm I'm starting on or I started this past week. I just throw it all in a pile and I go to the post office, take everything I can. So it may be something that's been ordered a week ago or two days ago, but I can guarantee for some of you it's going to be a couple weeks. And we are restocking again. And I really just want to express my dismay at the lack of consideration and and the lack of caring and compassion and em empathy, if not sympathy, that all the, the Cult of Cornet members out there had for my condition and have continued to browbeat me with, with this incredible business. Shame on them. They should be ashamed. Shame to themselves. These people at the post office, I feel bad for them, not you. Oh, and that's another thing. Bree's on vacation this week. I tried to give her $500. I said, fuck it, just work anyway. She wouldn't do it. She's on vacation this week. I mean, the other the other folks know me, but we got our our uh, our system down. So it's a, you know, I can, I can shovel 200 packages across that counter in a fucking hour and a half. She's right there with it. So it may, you know... The point is, have patience where you didn't have pity, ladies and gentlemen. Everybody's going to get their shit. Except I guess this is the time now to mention that the action figures are sold out and there'll be no more of those in this calendar year, at least, uh, of the original action figure. We uh, uh, China is uh, obviously a, a hot topic these days. Um, and we ordered... Uh, the the figure we ordered in December of 2018 for Christmas for summer and Christmas of 2019 and got that stuff in January of 2020 and we we actually we had ordered a variant also for Christmas that never came in and it's I think it's going to be two Christmases now so you never know when those are going to pop back up again but uh, but I apologize for anybody that missed out. Not like I didn't warn you. Anyway, what are we doing on this fucking program today? We're answering questions from the listeners. Hey, but real quick, I got to ask you about something because you and I both do a lot of business at the post office and, well, I mean, we're in different leagues. You practically have a room there. But I'm curious, what do you think when you hear about, I mean, this isn't just a current thing, but it seems like the post office always gets put down by the government. They're never taken care of by the government. They're the one company whose workers are out there right now risking life and limb yes and they're not a part of this big bailout that everyone else is a part of the stimulus package that everyone's a part of what do you think about the treatment of the u.s postal service by the government well first of all president pig shit uh wants to privatize the post office like he wants to privatize everything else so some of his friends can make some money but it's ridiculous there has to be everybody that's freaked out about the Constitution, and we, we've got to uphold the Constitution. The United States Postal Service has been a right of every American to have access to that since Benjamin fucking Franklin. And and b b before telephone or radio or any type of electronic communication or certainly email and blah, 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 people had to be able to communicate. That's the way the country was built. And even before the telegraph, the postal service and the, and the pony express, um, it, it, it's, and everybody gets to have access to a means, whether you can afford the internet, whether you can afford electricity, if you can afford, what is it? 55 cents. Now you can mail a fucking letter. And every American gets access to it. And it should be a complete governmental agency. And they, they, you know, they play with the, the uh, bookkeeping. 
I probably got some of their hints from fucking WCW and Turner Broadcasting and et cetera, et cetera. But um, whether it makes money or loses money, that's one of our rights as Americans to be able to send shit to each other for a legitimate fee that everybody can afford. So, of course, the Postal Service is... Uh, if if not a, a I don't even know if it's mentioned in the Constitution, but it's part of our rights as Americans, is it not? I think it certainly should be considered that, and I think from all the time I spend in the post office and I talk to my mail carrier, good people, good hardworking people, and I hate that they always get the short end of the stick, and it's like they're like they're like Guam or they're like Washington D.C. You know, Washington D.C is considered a territory, has the powers of a territory, not a state. And it's like the Postal Service, you know, part of the reason for their financial problems is the funny bookkeeping. And that they are, but they aren't a government agency. Yeah. Uh, But I just, it bothers me that they always get put down and that they're not taking... Well, and here's the thing, you know, the fucking uh, Felch gargling blunder cunt wants to bail out the cruise industry. The cruise ship, fuck the cruise ships. He doesn't want to bail out the post office, but he wants to bail out the cruise ship because he's got friends that own fucking cruise ship lines, I'm sure, or people have paid him uh, concurrently for same, but you know what they ought to do with those cruise ships? They ought to make them the jails. Think about it. Floating jails? Yes, because here it would help everybody. Because they said, well, the virus will spread the worst in jail where you can't practice social distancing. Well, if you're out on a boat in the middle of the fucking ocean, that's pretty social distanced. So the fucking crooks ain't going to get sick. Secondly, on the other side of the fence, it'll cut down on the fucking escapes. It'll be even better than Alcatraz. They don't have to swim a mile and a half to San Francisco. They got to swim 50 miles to fucking Mexico. The, the jails can be the cruise ships. Then they would actually be worth something because otherwise they're just floating Petri dish, Petri dishes, even, even before the coronavirus. How many times you hear of a fucking cruise ship that comes back, everybody's got the fucking plague or hooping belch or projectile fucking diarrhea or whatever the fuck. So take all the criminals, put them on the fucking cruise ships. And then it would be more pleasant, and then they'd have better scenery, and they'd feel like they were out in the open, even if they weren't. They could go out on deck, unsupervised. Where the fuck are they going to go? Well, the big issue with the cruise ships getting a bailout is none of them are headquartered in the United States for tax purposes. So well, why, so why should like, they get any tax dollars if they're going to have offshore offices specifically to skirt U.S. tax law? Well, of course, but that, well, that's part of the crookedness that is Trumpishness. But, you know, just speaking uh, yeah, with common sense, why is everybody all jacked up about, oh, the poor cruise line? I, I can understand airlines. People have to go from place to place for business and pleasure. I can understand the automotive industry. People have to have cars for transportation, and it's a major part of the American fabric, the auto industry. Uh, I can understand about any other innocent cruise lines. Fuck you. Get a goddamn, get a boat of your own. If you had go out on the lake, who needs to be <laughs> for fuck's sake? I'm not, yeah, it's just ridiculous. It's just ridiculous. I don't want to be trapped with anybody sick or not for four days on a fucking inescapable fucking location. I guess the point of this is be thankful for the U.S. Postal Service. They're good people. Yes. And and fuck the people that work for the cruise lines. <laughs> it's not the people who work for the cruise lines. That's the problem. Maybe the people Well, who they're the helping. Lines. They're helping. And it's and it's the the assholes that own the cruise lines. Yes, I know. All right. You know what I want to bring up again? We talked about this on one of the programs previously, and I can't remember which one it was because I'm brain dead. But the the releases, Vince Fire was it was just the experience this past week, right? Yeah. The the release of Vince Fire and ever and boy did he get some heat for that, by the way. And in several not just wrestling news sites or whatever, but like you know mainstream 
uh, websites were like, look, he's he's the first person to fire his employees in a pandemic. New Japan's paying everybody. Ring of Honor's paying everybody for what dates they were booked, even though they only you know run a few dates. They're paying everybody. Everybody else is like, okay, it's not the boys' fault, so we're not going to make any drastic fucking changes here. And Vince, you know, lops off everybody's head. Uh, but uh, Gallows and Anderson were two names that surprised us when you mentioned them to me. Uh, you were reading the list off. And because they were just with AJ, they were just being fucking used. They were just in a goddamn. And when we were watching Raw for that many months, for three weeks, uh, they were on the show and they did the, you know, they were in the, uh, what'd they call it? Not the buried alive, the, the boneyard, boneyard match. Boneyard match. And all of a sudden they fire. And then when I think back, they were being courted. They wanted to leave back last year when their deals were up, right? And they were being courted to stay and they were being given raises and trying to talk out of it. I don't know whether they wanted to go back to Japan or whether they wanted to go to uh, AEW, but they were they obviously weren't happy or they wouldn't want to leave. And they wanted to do whatever they want to do, which is fine, right? I like those guys. Um, but then they talk them into staying by giving... I just found out this figure after our discussion. They gave them $750,000 a year apiece to stay. No, you cannot go and leave when you want to where you and go where you might be happier. Uh, we're going to give you this money. And they have signed these deals and pledged their commitment and assumed they were going to get this money that they were promised. And then what, four months later, in the middle of a pandemic, when their other options are not running events, they go, no, never mind. Never mind. We're, we're, no, we changed our mind. Fuck you. Fuck you. That's bullshit. I get, if they weren't using somebody and they'd probably, you know, Hadn't used them in a while, but they've been getting paid anyway. Well, you go, okay, business is business. But that's the same thing, if you'll recall, same principle of the thing that they did to Danny Davis at Ohio Valley Wrestling in 2007. Because the just the year before, or six, not even the year, but like six months before they signed, or before they uh Ixnade OVW and withdrew the developmental program from Louisville. They had had Danny Davis <clears throat> sign new contracts with a new lease on the building and, you know, renewed it, which see, as we talked about, when we talked about the history of the developmental promotions, they were always owned by someone else, Steve Kern or Danny Davis or whatever. So Danny's name was on the lease. Danny's name was on the contract with the TV station. Danny Davis's name was on everything. And they went to some, no, OVW is in our plans, Danny. Go ahead and re-sign that lease for two more years and do this and do that. And they re-signed a contract with him, a two-year contract, that less than six months later, they said, nope, never mind. We're moving to Florida. So... What about Brett? Why? How long was Brett signed before Vince decided he didn't want to pay him? Oh, um, wait, uh, hold on. God damn it. I, I can't be exact, but it wasn't. It wasn't it a year. It wasn't a year. That's what <laughs> we were going to say the same thing. It wasn't a year. So what the fuck? It, it, I'm, you know, I said, I, and I'm, I'm not trying to just motherfuck Vince personally. He has been very nice to me at different times. He's also, you know, crazy. Uh, but he and Trump are more alike. Isn't that tr that's been Trump's gimmick since the dawn of time? Just do shit and don't pay for it, and or promise shit and don't come through with it. And it, when you think about it, and that's why I've told a few guys this in in recent years. But when they had have contracts without clauses, where oh, after every ninety days we can determine whether we still want to keep our word or not is basically what it is. Or we can just say, no, we're, we're releasing you. Then you don't sign a three-year contract. You sign a 90 day contract. I've brought that up since they started putting these out clauses in these contracts 
anytime anybody ever asked me, you know, not in front of Vince or whoever else was involved, I said, no, you're not signing a fucking three-year contract. You're signing a 90-day contract if that clause is in there. So, but still, that's not fucking Gallows and Anderson's fucking fault because why would you try to talk somebody into fucking staying, talk somebody into staying, talk somebody into staying because you don't want them to go work for somebody else and give them that much money and them think, okay, well, they're going to fuck us in three months. But that's obviously what it is because if they wanted them so bad three months ago to pay them that much money, it's not like they were no way Jose who I, I've heard, seen his name on the internet and I've never yet seen this fucking guy, but he just got released. It, it's not like it was that it, they were featured, they were courted, they were promised. And then as, once there's no competition, well, yeah, uh, ah, and I don't know why that uh, guys, you know, believe that's uh, not only I don't like to go back to where I didn't enjoy it the first time. If somebody fucked me around or lied to me or whatever, but I just, I can't understand this. That, uh, ah. And they're in a better position than others, even though they haven't been used properly in the WWE, they'll be able to get a job somewhere when this all ends, but they at least have their names. Yes. You know, guys like Drake Maverick, he can't use that name ever again. You know, guys, well, that, that might not be a bad thing. But, you know, the, the point I is... I like that kid, but I, the name it sounds like a fucking 70s gay porn star. Well, the point is they cut all these guys, and they don't just get cut from WWE. They also lose access to the name that mo the most amount of people would know them by. Well, yeah, and, and also, uh, and not even bringing up the subject that in the middle of a pandemic, nobody else is firing people, but the biggest company in the world is, but then they just gave out the stockholders is uh dividends. dividends this past week after they they came out to make the stock look good they come out and say we have 500 million dollars in cash and available credit and then they're trying to they fucking fire all these guys in the middle of a worldwide pandemic to save what 700 grand of a week did they say or something like that on salary i think it's um 750 grand, maybe a month, not a week. Or a, a month. Well, even, okay, well, well, that $500 million ain't going to last forever. But they've always been screwy with him because the, we've talked about it on the show here before. Hopefully people can look it up somewhere on the YouTube. Um, the whole independent contractor fiasco and how it's bullshit. And going back to, you know, the past several years. And then the when the last week tonight with John Oliver thing came out, we talked about it. And I think, didn't we have Steven on one time to discuss what is and is not an independent contractor? Yeah, we did. Um, but when, when I was there, uh, for example, when I went up there in 96 to work on the creative team, I was already under a talent contract and the talent contracts. Then I don't remember having 90 day out clauses in, in those contracts. I don't know whether that's for, they got smartened up to the fact they could do that or whatever. I'd have to go back and look and I can't reach it right now, but it was basically a, a you contract as a talent. And, and, uh, um, I, Trying to think, I don't even know whether I had a minimum. I did not have a minimum. <clears throat> I just had a talent contract, the old-fashioned ones, because I had been working primarily Smoky Mountain Wrestling. I'd just been coming up and and doing TV and pay-per-view uh, for the most part for the WWF. So I was just under a standard talent contract. Then when I come up to Connecticut in February of '96. They put me under another contract, a, a consultant's contract to be on the creative team because obviously people on the talent roster couldn't be employees, but they wanted to have me covered for and my additional pay and my additional responsibilities. So they put me under a consultant contract. You're following this, right? So now I got two contracts, but neither one of them make me an employee because you can't be an employee and be, you know, one of the boys who's supposed to be an independent contractor. So then in uh, early 97, 
Uh, Ed Kaufman, the one of the head legal guys, not Vince's private attorney, Jerry McDivitt, but Ed Kaufman was the head legal honcho of WWF corporate at the time. He sees me walking down the hall in the office and he's, oh, Jim, I'm so sorry. We have let your talent or we've let your contract expire because since I was under two contracts, they let one of them expire. And I can't remember which one it was now, but for the purposes of this story, it doesn't matter. But I looked at him. I said, Ed, it doesn't matter. I said, I'm here until either Vince don't want me to be here anymore. I want to go home and whatever you put on paper, ain't going to change that and just walked off. Right. (laughs) He was just freaked out that I wasn't concerned about my contract. What the fuck? But anyway, right about that time, because since I was at the end of 96, Vince decided to take me off of managing because I was still not making the the live events. I was just doing TV and pay-per-view and he wanted me to concentrate on the office. So, and, and the thing with Vader was not going to happen. We've told that story that SummerSlam 96 with Vader and Michaels was supposed to be what it was. And then Survivor Series 96, Vader was supposed to work with Sean in the return and fuck him and win the title. And then January 97, Royal Rumble in the Alamo Dome in San Antonio, Michaels was supposed to, that was the end of the trilogy, and Michaels would win the title back in his hometown in a stadium full of people. Instead, Sid got the title, and then Michaels won it back from Sid, yeah. Yes, because after SummerSlam, by the time that fucking Survivor Series rolled around, Michaels didn't want to work with fucking Leon, and it put the mouth on him enough and poisoned him with Vince that he'd changed it to Sid, who was... Believe it or not, Sean was thought Sid was going to be safer, <clears throat> and he was. Except you know, it shit happened by accident, but he was safer on purpose. Anyway, so at the end of '96, they're not going to do that with Leon, and now Leon's on Vince's shit list. So that's when I passed Leon off to Paul Bearer, and they took me off of managing. So at, at early '97, point being, they decide they're going to make me an employee. Because now I'm not on the talent roster as far as being a, a manager at the time. So they said, well, we're, we're going to make you an employee. Uh, okay. And what they had done when I first got up there is they said, normally, if you were an office employee or whatever, you would have the, the insurance, the health insurance and the life insurance and all this stuff. Well, we're going to pay for you for that. But because I wasn't an employee, they were just, they were basically, re- I took it out in my name and they're reimbursing me. See, I don't know how this shit works because I've never been an employee of anything. And, and except this time I'm telling you about. So now they say, well, just, we're going to pay you, but we're going to deduct your taxes and we're going to pay for the insurance and the blah, blah, blah. Okay. It's the same amount of money, right? Okay. Overall. So we go through all this paperwork and all this rigmarole. And I was an employee for two weeks. And when I got my check, that was a shock because I'd never had a check where the taxes were taken out. So I was like, fuck, this, this fucking looks painful on the surface of it. Anyway, so two weeks later, we go to a raw taping and they were stopped down for something technical. And they sent a baby face out to the ring and they sent me out to do something and kill some time. And then he's going to bump me out and make the people happy while they're trying to get their shit together. So we go out and do the promo, boom, 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 and he bumps me out of the fucking ring, whatever the case, and they go on with the taping, and next next day we got to the office. Ed Kaufman comes up to me. Jim, you were taking bumps last night. I said, yeah, we were killing some time. You can't do that. You're an employee. I said, well, that's going to come up. I'm still a a personality, and I'm out there. uh, If I'm not managing, I'm still out there doing announcing. Something may happen, and I didn't say I was never going to manage again um and what what we i say you know what just undo it just make me an independent contractor again because if i'm gonna take a uh, go out and kill some time at a tv taping i'm probably gonna take a bump and it's the only fun thing i'm doing these days so they unmade me an employee after two weeks and just put me back on the other fucking contract it's it it basically it boils and then Finkel, as we've just talked about, Howard Finkel was the first employee of Titan Sports when Vince first formed it, but he had tuxedo matches with fucking Harvey Whippleman because it tickled Vince. 
I, and I tried to tell him at the time, I said, we are all employees and it just Vince decides what we fucking do. And however you classify it, it doesn't matter because if Vince wants something to happen, you're going to figure out a way to get around it and let it happen. And so, but it's fucking insane anyway. Of course, nobody, nobody that's on the roster for the WWE should be considered an independent contractor, especially when you cannot even fart or choose your own verbiage on social media without it being approved by the office, but you're still an independent contractor. Can't get out of that contract either. And you can't get out of it. They can tell you to go piss up a rope. Anytime they want to every 90 days or whatever the fucking out clauses are, but you can't tell them who was it? God damn it. It was, um, Bill DeMott. When he was in WCW in the nineties, Hugh Morris, right? Yeah. He contacted me. I guess the statue, the statue of limitations on contract tampering is run as run out by this point, but he contacted me when I was up in up North and said, God, I'd love to, you know, come work for you guys. But he basically, he had a contract with WCW and he had, he said, is there any way, can you help in any fashion? And I said, take some, make a copy of the contract white out your name or any identifying marks, just it's, this is a con, a blank contract and send it up to me so I can have our legal department look at it. And he did. And I did. And they said, this is as close to indentured servitude as we have ever come across in a legal document. He is there until he dies or they tell him to fucking leave. And that, so WCW has some great contracts too, but fucking contracts in wrestling. Once you, <laughs> Once you get to the to the level of involvement with each other that you are working for a company like uh, the WWE or like WCW as it was run in those days, you're an employee. Now, all elite wrestling, no, they run one day a week and then a pay-per-view every three months or whatever, and you can work for other uh, promoters. No. Anywhere where you legitimately can work for other promoters or determine – what your name is or how you're presented, you're an independent contractor. When you work for the fucking WWE, you are a goddamn employee. You're an employee in spandex. And they've conned the government this long, and, you know, they'll continue to do so until there's a union. And then the first thing a union would do is say, well, this is fucking ridiculous. We're going to call the IRS and talk to somebody important. Because it, it, I've said this before, wrestlers should have always been independent contractors and should be independent contractors because that's the way that wrestling should be run. But if it's going to be run this way, then the WWE wrestlers not being employees is fucking idiocy. And it's against the law. And the IRS, I, well, wouldn't you know who won the pony? Guess who technically runs the IRS? We haven't even seen dipshits fucking tax returns much less get them to reclassify Vince McMahon and Linda McMahon's employees. But nevertheless, <clears throat> it, it, it's just, it's insane. But anyway, you know, Brian, Stephen P. New, I will say his name even before the music today. Stephen P. New was just recently talking about the fact that if wrestlers got together and, and formed a union, that some of these problems would be taken care of. And he actually uh, met uh, back in uh, in New York back last year when he was there. He actually met some of the big wigs with the Screen Actors Guild, SAG, not SAGs and knobs, but Screen Actors Guild, including I think the national president. And you know, asked him questions about it. He knows a little bit about this. So uh, we had him on here a few weeks ago talking about if you're an independent contractor or a gig worker, you might be eligible for unemployment now under the new rules if you're a wrestler so i think that somebody ought to get together and retain stephen p new to represent the entire wwe locker room on behalf of the united states government the irs statutes against the evil corporation that just fired a bunch of people in the middle of a pandemic don't you Stephen P. News. If you need to 
To the rest, you know, thinking back now, I don't know that you wanted me to play that there. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I love it. It was perfect. It was perfect. No, and see, that's the music that he could play when he came into the courtroom to face down Vince McMahon, and we could have pyro for him and everything. And finally, wrestlers would get their due and be treated like that's the whole thing is hey i'm all in favor of old fashioned wrestling let me just put the period on that i'm all in favor of old fashioned territory style wrestling where the guys booked themselves gave two weeks notice and blah 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 but if you're going to be operating at this level under these conditions and have 500 million dollars on hand then you shouldn't be firing your independent contractors in the middle of a pandemic and the point is whether it's this particular case or many like them that's what these basically huge corporations do. And the shady ba- uh, bookkeepers and bankers that they deal with and everything, uh, that's why you need somebody like Stephen P. New, newlawoffice.com, 888-692-8084, on your side. Because big corporations can manufacture shit and poison you or poison your atmosphere or your fucking living environment or take advantage of you or your family and you've got no recourse unless you've got somebody that can figure out all this bullshit that they've thrown in your path in order to keep you confused and get to the meat of the matter and the bottom of the situation and get your justice in a court of law, and that is Stephen P. New. And he's helping wrestlers with unemployment benefits and promoters with small business loans. He has advocated for a union in wrestling. Somebody's going to put out a hit on Stephen P. New, but he lives in West Virginia, not far from Roger Smith. So if you're expecting to fight Stephen P. New, you better pack a lunch. <laughs> Get ready for but Roger he, Smith. If, if he has to call Roger Smith to come down, you're in, you're in a heap of fucking trouble. <laughs> everybody, everybody up there in that one holler knows the Smith family. I'll tell you that anyway. Um, so yes, if you have problems in your life caused by these greedy major corporations and the avaricious nature of same, then give Stephen P. New a call at 888-692-8084. And he is still completely has a spotless record is undefeated against mud shows and grovers of all natures. That's right. Well, Jim, we have a question here. Sent to corny drive through at gmail.com. It's on a similar topic to what you were just talking about. This is from Darren in Hamilton, Scotland. I was wondering with the recent release of Mike Chioda, does this mean referees are not employees of WWE? Does the same apply to other on air talent such as managers, ring announcers, etc.? So, and then he asked if you were an independent contractor, but you just answered that. Well, we did. Well, see, I was, I had the precognition. Um, Nostra dumbass, they call me. Uh, you know, at one point, I'm not sure whether the referees were employees or not, because when, when once again, when I got there in the mid '90s, except for the 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 senior referees, um, like you know, Dave Hebner. Uh, well, now Dave was already an agent. Earl Hebner, um, uh, Timmy White. A lot of the referees were also the ring crew guys. Kyoto was on the ring crew back then. It's 20 something years ago. Uh, Jack Doan, um, you know, and then of course the, the, your main event referees were not, but most of the referees were also ring crew. And I don't know if they did that as independent contractors. They, they, they were getting bumped in matches. And I think that's, that was their whole issue from a legal standpoint back then is liability for employees taking bumps. So I can't say for sure about the referees, uh, bottom line of that. Uh, I've seen, you know, somebody said th- that they may have let Kyoto go because they're looking for younger people. What, now the referee has to be fucking, he's been there for 25 fucking years or more, I think more. And it, I would think loyalty might count for something besides, you know, you got a few wrinkles or whatever. I don't know. I'm haven't uh haven't seen him lately haven't spoke to him i miss a good old referee like dick worley or paul morton 
Some of them yeah, look you know, old. <laughs> yes, old and experienced. You know, the uh, like the old what Mills Lane. Yeah. Right. The, he looked like he he looked like Paul Morton. He looked like he was a hundred years old for fifty years. Paul Morton never aged. He looked he looked the same age. He always looked old. We thought he was fucking seventy when he was probably fifty because he lived another fucking thirty something years and he still looked the same. But, but you know, anyway, what was the rest of that question? That was really it with the question. But AEW wants to be all-inclusive. Let's get a referee who's over the age of 40. <laughs> uh, well, uh, they, they, well that, that could be a job for Tully since they won't put him on TV any other way. <laughs> the fuck? Well, let's get another question here on another hot-button issue. This was sent in the corny drive through at gmail.com. From Charlie in Starkville, Mississippi. Oh, I should have known. Cash Wheeler, that's the uh, former Dash Wilder, recently said that Vince McMahon wanted to turn the revival into a comedy tag team and that he even had creative come up with new ring gear. And attached to this email are images of what creative came up with. Apparently, these are 100% legitimate. I actually checked on this. I don't know if you've seen the you, pictures. You, you told me that. You told me that that you had checked. Well, you yeah, you know, I've seen the pictures because I I have seen Twitter, but you told me you were checking, and the, these are a hundred percent legitimate. A hundred percent legitimate, Jim. What do you think about Vince wanting to make the revival seemingly into a comedy tag team? Well, I actually I don't know whether they were supposed to be a comedy tag team or not. I don't know what they were supposed to be. What was that supposed to be? I saw a Dr. Seuss hat. The, the you know the fucking wrestler in the hat loves cheese please or what i what genre of what i mean like they went through the period of time where they everybody had to have a gimmick like they had a job so you had the plumber and you had the fucking the hockey player and you had to whatever what genre of employment was this supposed to be or what what image was this supposed to convey or wh- was it just a bunch of fucking dr seuss shit you know with somebody who was on acid what what was the theme of this i think there's a mindset amongst the higher ups in wwe that the audience are idiots <laughs> and they can't accept people for just being really talented and good wrestlers and having the best matches and people really getting into their matches they need some sort of wackiness some sort of character that the WWE can write really bad scripts for. I'm guessing uh, that may be what, what what if when you look at those outfits, what would that entice you to write for this guy? What the f- it was it was like they were were they demented fucking elf Keebler elves or or you know <laughs> Christmas characters in fucking Whoville? Are they holding glow sticks? Is that Are they? I don't know <laughs> what the fuck. <laughs> And I, 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 how would you even go to somebody and sit down with them and say, here is what we want you to do and show them that and explain it to, I, I guarantee you it was probably Bruce, but the explainer, Bruce Pritchard, the explainer that they made explain it to him because he's almost as good as Vince who can say a bunch of shit to make you until he walks away. And later on, you're reflecting on it. It almost makes sense when they say it, but <sighs> that's why obviously that's why they didn't want to be around there because whether they have those ideas, whether they're pissed at you or not, just anybody that could have that idea to make wrestlers look like that. I would want to get as far away from that environment as possible. So I'm not surprised that they fucking did, but can you imagine these guys best tag team in wrestling in years, having great matches whenever they get a chance, apparently they're house show matches. And I've seen a few of them. Off the charts. So much better than anything else because they're given time to do things. They're told that they want to do something new with them and they're presented with these images. (laughs) Like, how do you present this to these guys with a straight face and expect them not to just immediately say, please give me my release? Well, and see, that's... That's another thing. I used to... I'd sit there and look at Bruce and I'd say, Bruce... How the fuck are we supposed to fucking tell somebody that, that we want them to do X or whatever? He's like, oh, according to say, you know, just it's part of the story we're going to tell or whatever. I'm like, what is this? It looks like a fucking bad nightmare we're telling. Anyway, you know what you need to do? 
<laughs> don't know. I'm still trying to figure out what story they're telling with it. it looks like pirates going to a rave. <laughs> I don't know what these outfits are. <laughs> uh, but you know what you need to do? You need to take those pictures along with all the other pictures of bad, stupid, silly gimmicks that they've come from the gobbledygooker to, you know, all the, the plumbers and the hockey players and everything. And we ought to make a slideshow in a skylight frame. Whose house are we putting this skylight frame in to watch these photos? <laughs> well, probably Bruce Pritchard's. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> he may have one in every room. He, yeah, he could have one in every room. That actually, I, I, that could be his own personal hell. All the bad gimmicks that he's tried to sell guys on over the years. I think he was around for the gobbledygooker. He was around for uh, the Red Rooster. The Red Rooster. He defended the Red Rooster to my face. Well, what we need to do is we need to take pictures of all those fucking rotten gimmicks that Bruce Pritchard has defended on Vince's behalf over the years and put them in a skylight frame and have them in every room in Bruce's house so it's just like he's in the twilight zone. He goes from one room to another. He can never forget all the awfulness and horribleness of it. Uh, but the folks at Skylight Frames do not have to torture you. They can spruce up your home and make it look better than ever because we talked about this last week. Um... Stace has already got one for her mom since she was going to fly out to California this month uh, for two weeks and visit her mom and her sister and her family and everything. Didn't get to do that, had to cancel that. So she sent her the skylight frame and now she's her mom has a bunch of frames that are a bunch of frames, a bunch of pictures on it that she can look at. She got one for me and put Harley Quinn pictures so I can kind of rotate it and look and what what do they call it? I can touch frame, touch swipe, the slideshow thing. Well, the slideshow is always going, yes. but if you decide it's not going fast enough for you, you can go right yes. to the next photo. Yes. Yes, I can do that. I can do all this stuff. I can touch the screen. That's what I can do. <laughs> the frame does everything else. Well, everybody knows I don't know how this shit works, but you will, folks. Everybody else in the world can work a skylight frame. Um, you can, they've got a gimmick where if somebody sends you something you like, you can fucking touch and thank them for it. You can touch a lot of things with this instead of other people touch the skylight frames. Uh, it was a quick setup for Stace. It's effortless to email the pictures. If you know how to email, like most people do, uh, it looks good in the house. And since everybody's away from family and loved ones and not able to go visit like Stace wasn't or whatever, Maybe this is kind of the next best thing. Send something to somebody that you can keep sending to and show them that, uh, that you love them. And once you buy the frame, you can send all the shit for free. So you can keep sending shit endlessly. It's not like the pictures I have on my wall. Once you put that picture in a frame and put it up there, you got to physically change it and do something different. Anyway, go to Skylight Frames. That's S-K-Y-L-I-G-H-T. Skylight Frame dot com skylightframe.com and enter code jce and get 10 bucks off the purchase of a skylight frame and let your loved ones know that you haven't forgotten them which that's especially helpful whenever they go to revamp their their wills something cool for yourself and it's a fantastic gift i have to say we've become a big fan of the skylight frame here in the house you're a big fan of a lot of things hey you know who's not in bruce pritchard's skylight frame Who's that? Peter Burkholz and Paul Bosch. <laughs> oh, well, he ended up on the other side of that one, didn't he? Yeah, he was the he was the office stooge leaking all the info to Vince so Vince could steal the office. Now you do not know that for sure, just because that's what everybody else said. Tell me I'm saying something that's <laughs> false. Tell me I'm saying something that isn't true. I don't I know more than hey. you think about this one. <laughs> I, I I got the, the copy of Paul Bosch's unedited manuscript of his book, which was slightly stiffer than, than the actual uh, published product. But one of the lines after the Paul Bosch retirement show, Bruce has one story of it. But on the other hand, Paul Bosch's interpretation was that Vince McMahon's tombstone should read, Here lies Vince McMahon, the man who destroyed faith in the handshake. Yeah, I'll, I'll go with uh, Paul Bosch and Peter Burkholz on this one. 
Well, yeah, if I was a betting guy. But anyway. We got some more questions. We got some more questions. This one, another hot button issue. Sent in on Twitter using the hashtag corny drive through from Pete Boyle. I hope you've been following this. What are Jim's thoughts on WWE holding their next pay-per-view money in the bank at Titan Towers, where apparently instead of there being ladder matches to get a suitcase, it is now a free-for-all battle from the ground floor. I don't know if they start in the parking garage, but at least the ground floor of Titan Tower to the very roof to get a suitcase that'll be hanging from something. I think they should actually uh, start in the parking garage because there's like uh, three or four levels of parking garage and then four floors on top of that of actual offices and everything. On the second floor, they used to have, remember Sergeant Slaughter's camouflage limousine from the 80s? Of course. That was still parked there with four flat tires in 1999, <laughs> the last time that I pulled out of the office. Um, Right over in the corner on the second floor. And it had been fucking 15 years anyway i do you think they planned this when they thought they were moving to new headquarters and they were like okay we'll just tear the old one up or you know is this a recent idea you think holy fuck i i mean it's one of those it's one of those things I've mentioned it before, Stockholm Syndrome. It's one of those things where they have the money and they have the budget and they have the contacts for the, you know, to have things built that looks like real walls that they can go through or the special effects. The same thing with the Boneyard match. They have the the budget and the wherewithal where they can do so, all kinds of wild shit with with a concept like that and that's what vince likes his concepts and somebody what if we just have everybody start at the ground floor they got to fight to the roof and then whatever's on the roof they probably got to go up the fucking flagpole who knows but that's an idea that one of the writers will have and it's a concept that vince can then imagine and you'll see his eyes you know get wide and you'll hmm and then they'll start saying, well, they'll start pitching, well, this could happen on the third floor where, you know, they could go in the gym and do this, or they could go in the, the commissary and do that over the chicken fingers or whatever. And Vince loves that kind of shit. And the, to please Vince, much like, you know, the dogs trying to please their master, once they've seen that, you know, the eyebrow go up in the eyes and the mmm and the, the thought process start, they will start pitching shit. And it'll run away from itself. And then they'll actually be doing it. And then, and of course, now the, the writers, they, they're happy to be doing anything that they've suggested. But at some point, for a wrestling person, seeing some of this shit go on, and there weren't even nearly as many writers there. There weren't writers there then, but just the people pitching and the production people and et cetera, you start to kind of get carried away with it. I said I was on board with the buried alive match. It's like actually I got there in the in the arena and I saw it. I said, you know, this is kind of preposterous. But you lose yourself in it, but the writers have no wrestling background and they don't give a fuck about the integrity of anything related to a wrestling match. So now they're getting the opportunity to fucking do these cinematic mini movie things, and that's gonna look great on their resume when they want to get a job at, you know. Goodson Todman or whatever the fuck. Um, and, and you'll just, and they'll, they'll do it. And it, 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 it you know, it's, it's probably going to be visually something. How about, there's a recommendation for it. It's going to be visually something, but they've got enough money to spend to where it, it'll, it'll look good on camera, but it, it doesn't have anything related to do related to wrestling. If, if two guys were at the office and cameras were there to capture them in a contract signing and they got in a believable argument, which led to somebody getting slapped in the face and somebody leg diving somebody, then I can believe they can fight out that office and down the hall and they could do a couple of things and maybe take a nice bump into something and break some shit. But once it goes on, as we mentioned, a, a, a fight like that over a long period of time in the cool location gets old when, you know, it, 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 we did a thing with uh, the Fantastics and the Heavenly Bodies in, in Smoky Mountain where 
We continued fighting in the back hallway of the fucking East High School in Morristown. And goddamn, there were boxes and there were poles and there were brooms and there were things you'd find in the hall at a table and things you'd find in the hallway of a fucking high school gym. And then out the back door and jumped in our car to pull away and Bobby Fulton caved the back windshield in with a fucking lead pipe and that took three minutes tops. You know, you can't do it forever or it starts looking hokey, even with a good budget and being shot well. Um... And and to to start off to say we're going to have a match like this, the sanctioned match where they're going to fight all through the fucking and go up to the roof. Well, yeah, it's cool, except it's also stupid for just for your credibility and for any legitimacy and just so there's ways to have fights in cool locations, but I'm afeard this is going to be another firefly funhouse or fucking last man standing instead of even the boneyard at this point do you think they'll go into vince's office well i i would think they almost have to if they're going to be there but who knows maybe they'll go into my old office they probably still got it roped off with caution tape <laughs> but i mean it just it, it, it it's in no way would this be a legitimately sanctioned thing that anybody would be allowed to do if it was real, not only for the chance of, you know, physically being injured themselves, but also because the company wouldn't want however many guys, well, how many guys are in it? Six or however many fucking people are in this money, the bank match. They wouldn't want six fucking professional fighters having a, anything goes fight in their goddamn office building with the goal being to go all the way through the thing. That wouldn't be a thing that would happen if it was real. So therefore, automatically, you've just told people, well, we're just doing some hokey shit. Well, here's another thing. And I guess maybe the McMahons have spent enough money throughout the last 35 years that they're not worried about it. But the state of Connecticut, I believe, is another one of these states here in the Northeast where everything is shut down. You're not supposed to have gatherings and do things. I can't imagine they're working in the offices of Titan Towers. Or do you? Is it towers or tower? I mean, it's one tower. Titan Tower is what it is. Titan Tower. I mean, I know Faulty Towers was technically one building, but no, it's it's just one tower and one, and it's not plural. Titan Tower. But uh, but do you think Vince gives a shit? No. And besides, I I would love to see somebody come to Vince McMahon and tell him you've got to leave Titan Tower and take everybody with you. I'd love to see that. I don't care if it's goddamn general fucking patent. So, no, I don't think he gives shit about that at all. Well, our next question, Jim, sent in on Twitter using the hashtag corny drive through from Sean McCarty. What are your thoughts on Mike Jackson appearing on Impact this past week? While I've always enjoyed him myself, what are your overall, excuse me, what is your overall opinion of Mike? Do you have any fun stories of him from your time together in Mid-South? And, of course, well, this is referring to Jim. I doubt you watch Impact. Mike Jackson, at the age of 70, had a match with Johnny Swinger. And I guess pretty similar to his entire career, everyone was amazed at how good Mike Jackson was at his advanced age. But that was really the story of him throughout his career, how good he was. Yeah, well, and I did see a, a Twitter clip where he did a dive and walked the ropes, did some stuff. Um, and I, I like Mike Jackson. I first saw him... On Memphis Television in 1974, he and Tony Ledoux, Mike Jackson and Tony Ledoux, were an underneath babyface tag team, and they'd get shit kicked out of them by the main event heels on on TV every week. But Mike, at the they announced him at a hundred, I think at that time a hundred and ninety pounds, and of course that was giving him thirty. But nobody was announced at under 200 pounds in those days, except Jerry Jarrett. They announced Jerry Jarrett at 198 because he was a top baby face and wanted the sympathy. Subliminally, he was just a little bit smaller than everybody else. But nobody was announced whether they were or not at under 200. But Mike Jackson, they couldn't stretch it. They had to say 190 for Mike. He's always been tiny, but he was in the exact same physical shape. And... He worked for years, uh, uh, being from Alabama, he worked more on the Nick Goulas's end uh, than he did Jerry Jarrett's end. 
But, uh, you know, Mike has always just stayed in shape and always took pride in, in what he did. Those TV matches he had in the 80s, every time we'd get Mike Jackson, Mike Jackson or George South, that's where we'd sit down with him and, and Bobby Eaton and come up with a goddamn, you know, a, a great high spot, right? Because they could do the shit. And I saw Mike, was it, was it at the Charlotte reunion or it might have been another place a couple of years ago? And I said, you know, because I hadn't kept up with him here recently, but I knew he was still working every so often. But he, just, he told me he was working and he hoped his, he hadn't told his wife that he was doing it. I said, why not? He said, because I just had, was it gallbladder surgery or what else can you have taken out without killing you? Appendix? Appendix. That's what it was. His, he, just, he said, I just had my appendix taken out a couple weeks ago. I said, what the fuck? You're going to fucking wrestle and take butt? Well, you know, my wife would have been happy if she knew. And, and he had a match and was good and was fine. And he's 70 years old now. He, he trains. He's in the same shape. He's physically, except for gray hair where he has hair, he looks body-wise exactly the same as he did 45 years ago. And so, you know, I mean, uh, bravo. I'm, I'm glad for Mike. Of course, he also, he's the one that used to bring those guys up from Alabama in the car with him, and he'd charge them a booking fee to get them booked as job guys on on Atlanta TV. Uh, that's why we always say, well, they it was whoever they could find to work with the Road Warriors that Mike Jackson had brought in his car and smartened up that week. Uh, but uh, so that he was also known inside the business for bringing all those guys that got the shit kicked out of them in classic fashion on Atlanta TV. Do you have any issue with him? working at the age of 70 well and everybody also said well why don't you take the piss out of it when the rock and roll express are 60 something and win the nwa world tag team title again well they they made it work in front of the audience that that was receptive to it to begin with and they i don't think they embarrassed themselves they made it work i don't know they should have a long reign i guess everybody's gonna have a long reign until anybody defends anything again um, but with, with Mike, what he, was he against a main event guy? I don't follow Who, impact, Chad, but Johnny. I don't, well, I, Johnny Swinger, I've just answered my own question. I don't yeah. think, you know, and also it's impact. So there are no main event guys, but when he had a, you know, when he's obviously in that fucking remarkable of shape and actually works probably better or more precisely than most of the people on the card and didn't embarrass himself. And it wasn't the main event for the world championship against a guy twice his size. I don't think I, I, I have more problem with guys who look like shit, who haven't been properly trained, who, uh, uh, you know, are just doing this for a fucking goof or, or fun or whatever getting in anywhere on any platform and going out and jacking off and doing phony shit then I do a guy of that age in that remarkable condition who's done this for 45 years and is very good at it, showing that he can still go. But I'll tell you what, you know what I bet he needed afterwards, Brian? What's that? I bet he needed some Omax cryo-freeze. Ah, of course. And as a of course, now you see it. And as a matter of if I had Mike Jackson's address, I would send him some because no matter how sore he got, the next day, he could smooth some of the Omax recovery cream on, take some of the rapid relief drops, or just roll on that roll-on cryo-freeze, and instantly, the pain dissipates. It dissipates, baby. Can you imagine how much he would have used when he was working with the Road Warriors? Oh, good God. You'd have had to just dip him in the stuff. Just take him by the Achilles heel and just dip him in the stuff. But anyway... Uh, no, we've talked about Omax. We read the email uh, a week or two ago from artists down in Georgia who not only discovered the, through our efforts, discovered the Omax cry freeze, the roll on, but then later on the recovery cream and the rapid relief drops. And it's helping him play with his son now after his injury that he had. But if you have sore joints, sore muscles, general aches and pains, you don't want to go to a chiropractor because well, we're all fucking quarantined. You don't want to go out in public and have people place their hands on you because they could be sickness ridden. 
So get Omax CryoFreeze Advanced Joint Defense by going to Omax, O-M-A-X, OmaxHealth.com and enter the code JCE and you're going to get 20% off. And we've had a bunch of the Cult of Cornet listeners that have tweeted how much this stuff helped them and it can help you too. Don't let uh, joint pain and bodily aches and aging prevent you from being active and living a healthy lifestyle go to omaxhealth.com and feel relief faster nothing i hate worse than sore muscles nothing well a, a, a sore a sore dick because a sore dick you just you just can't beat a sore dick <laughs> didn't expect you to go there <laughs> well yeah you, you can't beat a sore dick i'm telling you that's the worst well, for your sore muscles, you so mad. <laughs> <laughs> Wolfman's got nards, man. Anyway, <laughs> that'll now be you later. Watch it. Now you have to watch that movie, Monster Squad. When do I have time to watch it? You were just browbeating me, just just <laughs> whacking me over the head right before we went on the air because I haven't watched certain things. I have not watched anything. I've had the television on in the background while I've been performing my 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 functions and my duties as the head of Cornette's Collectibles and as the head of the Jim Cornette Empire to record and fill orders. That is what my life is now. I record and I fill orders. Do you have music have on in the background? Watch. Do you listen to anything? No, because if I have music on in the background, then I'm going to sit there and look up and start thinking about the first time I heard that song. It was the summer of 69 or whatever the fuck, and then I'm going to get lost. No, I have the news on so I can tune it out but still – through some osmosis, I can pick up on what's going on, but it's not something you have to visually watch because I'm concentrating on other stuff. All right, well, let's see if we can get an answer for this next question through osmosis. Sent in the corny drive through at gmail.com from Daniel O'Connor in County Limerick, Ireland. Hi, Jim. I was listening to Scott Hall talking about a WWF show he did in the 1990s in Calgary, after the show, Bret Hart invited a lot of the wrestlers over to his house. Scott Hall thought this was a really great gesture by Bret. Bret gave Scott Hall a guided tour of the house, and in every room there was a picture of Bret in his wrestling gear. When Bret brought, <laughs> when Bret brought Scott to his bedroom, there was a huge picture of Bret over the bed where Bret slept with his wife. Scott left the house thinking that Brett was the biggest mark for himself in the wrestling business. Jim Cornette, were you ever invited to Brett's house? <laughs> and if you were invited, can you confirm Brett the Hitman Hart has a picture of himself in every room and a huge picture of himself above his bed? I, I will. First of all, no, I cannot confirm that because I've only been to Calgary, Alberta, Canada one time in my entire life. And that was the, what was it, the uh, it, uh, Stampede pay-per-view in 97. Yeah, Calgary Stampede. Calgary Stampede. I was trying to say International Stampede. The Calgary Stampede pay-per-view in 97 and uh, drove immediately after that to Edmonton where we were doing Raw the next night. So I was only in Calgary one night, never invited to Bret Hart's house. By the way, it's freaky fucking weird weather up there. It was 10 o'clock at night and broad daylight and people out working in the fucking fields on the farms in between Calgary and Edmonton at 10 o'clock at night. I've never seen anything like it. It was fucking strange. Anyway, um, I cannot, you know, <laughs> I can believe that Brett probably has a few pictures up, uh, but it, once again, it's Scott Hall, so take the story and it, possibly wrestlers uh exaggeration take story with a with a grain of salt but um I, I i mean i have tons of pictures of me up in my office uh because it's my office but there are no pictures of myself up except with family in any other rooms of the house so i you know it's kind of the the theme is other rooms have their their other themes but uh i you know you would be a little excessive if you had a picture of yourself in your gimmick in every room of your house what is the oddest thing you've seen in a wrestler's home oh god i mean you know not i'm trying to think of Odd stuff. I mean, I haven't been to a lot of guys' houses that would that would have the odd stuff. I've 
<laughs> not as, not exactly. I mean, I'm sure if we went to David Schultz's compound down there in Tennessee, we'd find some interesting things. Uh, there was always some type of workout equipment uh, of of various kinds. Uh, uh, sometimes furniture, sometimes not. Um, what was Jake's house like when you went there in '94? It was a normal house in suburban Atlanta. Didn't seem odd at all. I mean, I didn't go poking in his goddamn bedroom closet, but from what I was in, it was a nice suburban home, well, fairly well kept and up to date, which he obviously got with money he made from Vince because he wasn't making enough money to live there at that particular point in his life. All right. Well, I guess we don't have any real conclusion. I don't really have any conclusion. I have no, I have no go home for this bit. So I will take a small bow. Can Thank you believe you. that Bret Hart would do this when have pictures of himself all over? I can't. De- I well, I was, that's why I'm saying I can't denounce this story. I've, you know, it, it, I can't denounce it. Is what I'm saying. It is Scott Hall. It may be a little exaggeration. Maybe not every room, but I think there's a, the the grain of truth is that probably most rooms did indeed have a picture of Brett in his gimmick. This is one of those things you hear about Brett from some of those guys like Scott Hall. I'm a big Brett fan, but what do you think about the argument that Brett took himself too seriously and was a mark for himself? Well, I've even I've even said that before in some cases that Brett took, I don't, I didn't say Mark for himself, but took himself too serious. He didn't take the business too seriously. I always appreciated the seriousness with which he approached the wrestling business, which was passed down to him by his dad and his, his older brothers. Um, every once in a while, I wish he could have lightened up about himself. Uh, but, but I'd rather somebody, you know, in hindsight, err on that side than these fucking jack offs that don't take, themselves or the business or anything else seriously. And I think that's how, you know, with Brett and Sean, it was all oil and water because Brett took his business seriously and took what he was involved in seriously. And Sean Michaels was just jacking off and didn't give a fuck uh, about anything. So they just, you know, that was going to happen, but I'd rather take the guy taking himself seriously these days than it's gone so far in the other direction. Our next question sent in the corny drive through at gmail.com. Actually, excuse me, sent it on Twitter using a hashtag corny drive through. Well, now you change your story. From Jesus 2020. And it looks like he sent the same question to the drive through email. That's why I was getting a little confused here. Okay. Oh, now you've always got an excuse. I would love to hear your impressions about the career of Dick Steinborn. Dick Steinborn, of course, just passed away uh, within a couple of days as we're recording right now. Yeah, and he was one of the older guys in the business at this point, wasn't he? Was in his late 80s? Late 80s, yeah. Um, I met Dick Steinborn in 1977. Uh, you know, we may have talked about it before, but when in 1977, when they had wrapped up the big program with Lawler and Dundee in Memphis, after all those sellouts and that big business, Lawler, that's Elvis had just died. Lawler decides to retire and focus on his music career because he's already done those, you know, those early singles and everything. Well, it was really, it was just a, it was a six week program for Lawler to go away so he could come back as a baby face. Well, um, at that point they needed to crown a new Southern champion. So they had a tournament and that's where Jimmy Valiant first came to the territory. Jerry Jarrett just got him from bruiser and it wasn't planning on him being a, one of the biggest stars that's ever come to Memphis. He was just a name and he was off on the weekdays and he was living in Indianapolis. But so anyway, they did tournaments in Memphis and in Louisville. Like they repeated the, the cards in Louisville and Evansville and you know, the other towns after they did them in Memphis well, Jared called an audible when he saw how strong Jimmy Valiant was getting over in Memphis. He sent the audible out with Dundee and said, put, put Valiant over. And so he won the tournament in Memphis, but he didn't win the tournament in Louisville because he hadn't cleared all those dates with bruiser and blah, blah, blah. So the next week, Mr. Wrestling, who was presented to be Tim Woods, but was actually Dick Steinborn <laughs> came in and won the title because that way Jared had, Mr. Wrestling, allegedly Tim Woods, a major babyface as champion in the northern towns and Jimmy Valiant, the heel in the southern towns and blah, blah, blah. And it was split up for a few weeks. 
until they reconciled the whole thing. But that's where I first saw Dick Steinborn. And he was, he was an excellent wrestler. And he not only uh, as himself, but he carried off the Mr. Wrestling gimmick uh, quite well also because he'd been, a, at that point, he'd been in the business since he was a teenager. So he was like a 25 year veteran. And he was also a photographer. So I got a chance to talk to uh, talk with him a little bit about uh, photography. I was just starting out at that point in time at the matches, but he did the pictures for the uh, program in Knoxville uh, and uh, did a lot of uh, work for them for, you know, on the photography side and et cetera. And I guess worked another, what, almost 10 years after that, he's ended up spending uh, until the mid eighties. He, he, and he was on top almost everywhere he went through the 60s, 70s, and 80s. So he he was one of those guys that he stayed in in the same kind of physical shape, like a Mike Jackson. And he had really, you know, uh, he had started young anyway, so he was around for fucking forever. And his father, Milo Steinborn, was a promoter and had been a strong man in the, what, 1920s? Before that, maybe even. Maybe even before that. So, uh so yeah, very interesting guy. Some we some stories we may tell later on when it's not uh, timing is not an issue because he there was some interesting stories about Dick Steinborn's outside the ring exploits, but possibly now is not the proper time to bring something like that up. So remind me in two weeks. <laughs> Our next question, Jim, sent in the corny drive through at gmail dot com from DC in DC. If wrestlers are supposed to be big, strong, tough individuals, why are their armpits clearly shaven? <laughs> when was the first time you recall seeing this as being the norm? Uh, when's the last time that you thought it was going to be a real good idea to have some sweaty fucking beast fucking grab you in a headlock with a big fucking tuft of hair under his armpit? That's the whole idea. You, you... You're not shaving your armpits for cosmetic reasons. You're shaving your armpits for goddamn philosophical reasons. Be uh, Love your neighbor and be nice to your opponent. Um, if you go back and look, Dutch Mantell in the 80s in Memphis, he not only, he he shaved his sides, the actual side, his, his sides, because he was so hairy, he was covered with hair all the way around, and if he grabbed you in a headlock, it wasn't just his armpit. It, your head was in in the middle of wet hair all the way down his side. So he kind of shaved it to where it looked like it was natural. It kind of tapered off. It, you know, but he would shave the sides. He shaved his wrists so he could put tape on because his wrists were so hairy that he couldn't pull the fucking tape off if he put it on. I, as a matter of fact, at one point, I think he was shaving the back of his fucking knuckles. <clears throat> but but no, that's that's not anything new, and it's not to make the end of all it's a bodybuilding thing also that, you know, guys shave their entire bodies now and they put the baby oil on as so they look better. But, but and, you know, it's always been a somewhat of a common sense thing that if you had excessive body hair in places and if you had real hairy legs and you were going to give somebody a fucking head scissors, you needed to do something about that. You know, I mean, my God, I won't mention any names, but I saw a, a female wrestler one time that in at a certain point in the fucking match, her her bathing suit bottom had had come up and pulled up and it looked kind of like a wedgy thing. And it, it looked like she had a fucking Beatles wig crapped in. <laughs> oh, come on, name names. Come on. Well, no, I just but, it looked, but I'll tell you, you know, and here's another thing. Here's another thing. You know what's causing all that is excessive body hair, but you know what can solve all that, Brian? Oh, I know our, this one. Our friends at Manscaped. Because <laughs> right now, the quarantine edition of the Perfect Package is ready for you. The Perfect Package 3.0 comes with the new and improved Lawnmower 3.0, the waterproof cordless body trimmer. Holy mackerel. We've an LED light so you can shave in the dark. You can't possibly nick yourself. It's a cutting edge, and there's no cutting involved. It's it's major science fiction uh, edge blade to uh, to use so you can't nick yourself, prevents accidents, 
You also get the Manscaped Crop Preserver. It's an anti-chafing ball deodorant and moisturizer. And the Crop Mop Ball Wipes, the, the pH balance. You're sitting on your couch at home alone with Pete in hand anyway. You might as well keep everything smooth and smelling good. And the Perfect Package 3.0, available now from Manscaped, for a limited time, also includes not one but two free gifts if you subscribe to this package. The Shed Travel Bag, which is the $39 value, and the patented high-performance anti-chafing Manscaped boxer briefs because the last thing you want is a chafed dick. I'll guarantee you that right now. So the perfect package for your perfect package, and if you go to manscaped.com and use the code DRIVE, then it's free shipping and 20% off everything on the fucking site. And I have just used it because now you can't even get a haircut because why do I want sissy down at Great Clips fucking breathing all over me as, as the dream machine used to say, blowing her whiskey smelling breath and shaking her nicotine stained fingers in my face right up on me to cut my hair. I don't want that because she could have a deadly virus. So I've been taking the lawnmower 3.0 and trimming around my ears and my, the back of my neck and various other places because you can use it anywhere. What about and the wolfman? I, well, you can, you can shave the wolfman's nards <laughs> with the lawnmower 3.0. And while it is hardy and sturdy enough for a man, it is gentle enough for a woman also. So if there's any landing streeps, stri landing streeps, landing strips <laughs> that need to be shaped on your female cohorts in the house, well, now you can you can use this too. Anyway, 20% off free shipping, manscaped.com. Drive is the code. Did I say JCE on a code earlier? Oh, I, don't I know. sure did. I sure did. Which one? I don't know. Well, use Drive if you're listening to this program. Yeah, don't even you don't even have to edit that out. Just use <laughs> just use Drive if you believe for all these codes. Oh, God damn it. I'm fucking going out of my mind. On the topic of sissy, though, cutting your hair, do you have that option? I mean, every barber shop or any place to get your hair cut around here is mandatory shut. Can you go get your hair cut in Kentucky? Well, I don't know because I haven't gone to try to get my hair cut. So I guess you can't. I don't know why, you know, uh, I don't know why they would be open. It's not essential. We can all go around looking like savages, I guess. I try to get my hair cut once every four weeks. How many, the, the, how many weeks has it been? It's been eight weeks now. Oh, boy. I was about due when, the, when all this shit started happening. You know, Vince, I've told you about Vince's haircuts, right? In Manhattan. At, right? at the hotel in Manhattan, the $100 haircuts. He would go once a week, except if he was out of town on an extended trip. He would go once a week. He would be driven from, Connect, from Stamford, Connecticut, down into Manhattan, to go to this hotel where there was this uppity tuppity barbershop and this is the same guy would cut his hair and he would give the, it, 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 me and Bruce talked about this, a hundred dollars for the haircut. This was in 1996 and he'd still tip the guy on top of that. I can't imagine how much it is now and how much could your hair grow in a week? And he's always shaving his facial hair, you said. Well, yeah, oh, he shaves with the electric razor. Every time he gets in the back seat of the fucking limousine, he's shaving with the electric razor, gouging his face to make sure that any whisker that pops its fucking head up is whacked quicker than a fucking whack-a-mole in Myrtle Beach. It's almost as if he has some compulsion issues. It's almost like that, isn't it? Almost, yeah. Almost. He wants to control the hair on his own face. Can you see Vince with a beard? At his oh old God, age? No. Oh, no. Oh, God, no. No, I, I, the, the most... On our writing days, sometimes it, where Vince would be in his home, and we'd get there at 9 o'clock, so it's not like he's been out and about, right? He's been up and probably worked out, but he'd be wearing casual clothes or workout sweats or whatever. Every once in a while, it would look like he hadn't shaved that morning it would look like he hadn't shaved until the previous, since the previous night. 
that was the longest amount of facial growth I ever saw on Vince McMahon in all the years I knew him. Maybe he didn't shave quite that morning before we got there. He looks awful now because, you know, when he went gray, he embraced it and he looked kind of all right. And now he dyes it and he just looks like that old man with the dyed hair. He looks awful. Well, wait a minute. If he if he went gray and now is dying it, now that the people why that's like trying to not expose your business after you've exposed your business. If people have seen you gray, they know you're gray. So anytime they see you dark headed, they know you're bullshit, right? You would think. So so why would you do that? And he always had a weird issue. Jesse Ventura said that Vince was like always telling him to make fun of his wig, even though it wasn't a wig. Well, it's because his hair is always perfect because he gets a hundred dollar haircut once a week. Once a week. So so That's people ridiculous. would fucking people would laugh about how hair perfect his hair was. All right. Well, let's get another couple questions here on the show. I guarantee you that Vince has never had anything as great as Manscaped, though. I would guess that you're probably right. Promo code drive. Promo code drive. Well, this question was sent in the corny drive through at gmail.com from Chris in Chesapeake, Virginia. I'm going to guess, Jim, that you have not had a chance to watch AEW from this past week. Well, you'd, you'd win a lot of money on that bet. I was listening to commentary on AEW during the Chuck Taylor Kip Sabian match. At some point, Tony remarked about Chuck. Well, and also, by the by the way, by the way, I'm sorry, but I don't really want to see a wrestling match with anybody in it named Kip. He's all right. You're too hard on him. Or Claude. Well, Claude, I'll give you. Although Thunderbolt Patterson may have a thing or two to say about that. I I've seen Thunderbolt Patterson matches in person. And I and I'm sorry that I did. Well, at least the fans were into it. Boy, boy, when he came to when he came to Tennessee for a brief little while, he didn't have the fucking whole history of Atlanta behind him, and it didn't translate. <laughs> Ooh, got over like a fart in church. Well, back to this during the Chuck Taylor Kip Sabian match. You know, Kip. At some point, Tony remarked about Chuck's physique, and Jericho said that Bobby Eaton didn't have the best physique but he was one of the best workers ever. They were insinuating that Chuck E.T. was the new Bobby Eaton. Any thoughts? <laughs> I think Jericho just wanted to mention Bobby Eaton's name on television and was trolling everybody else. No, Chuck Taylor looks like a goddamn sack of wet hammers. Uh, he's got a fucking awful fucking frame, no definition, no tan. Uh, he's almost sway back the way he tries to stand up and kind of bow up and that fucking haircut and that face. So, uh, the, the, yeah. Uh, all I can say is, uh, both, both, uh, Jesus Christ and Stalin both had beards. That's where the <laughs> similarities in. All, right. all right. Our next question sent in the corny drive through at gmail.com from Tim King. Would the Legion of Doom 2000 have worked if they left out the 2000 and Sonny and did it in late 1997? Oh, God, I remember. You know, Sonny looked great with them. Um, for the brief period of time, I have a actually a publicity picture. It was Hawk and Animal with Sonny. They had the fucking spikes. She had like a female Road Warrior outfit on. That picture looked great. Um if they had ever been able to figure out what made the road warriors work and just done it instead of trying to make the road warriors WWF ish. Yes, it would have worked, but they never did that. So it didn't matter what, what time they, what time period, what era they did it, that road warriors didn't get over in the WWF in what was it? 1990. And they didn't get over in 1997, and they didn't get over at the last time, LOD 2000, which was in 98 or 9, actually. They jumped that up a little bit. Um, because they didn't know. And then with Hawk's issues, once that they took Hawk out of the team or tried to for a second and make it Animal and Draws, then that had shot that whole thing to hell anyway. But they just never could figure out Hawk and Animal were not a natural fit for the WWF environment anyway. Because when Vince tried to make his own demolition, Bill Eady was still 
he was a, a, a veteran and a great worker and knew the WWF style and could have those matches that way. And Darso was young and, and, uh, and a good athlete, but he could be the, you know, the partner. But they had WWF style matches with a demolition gimmick. The Road Warriors came out and were themselves on their promos off the top of their head and in the fucking matches. They did their shit and they were, it was like Goldberg streak. They, the, in WCW, Goldberg had a streak. In WWF, Goldberg had a fucking Harpo Marx wig. That's the difference. The, the Road Warriors, every time, the thing with the fucking talking dummy. Rocco, the one time, yeah. them them not getting Paul Ellering's importance to the whole fucking thing, them not uh, allowing them to be the road warriors and be smashed over like they were and have these bloody, violent fucking house show main event matches against heels. Um, it just it, it didn't translate. The WWF was too clean for the road warriors. They were the definition of the, you know, baddest asses in the, in the fucking business. And people had seen them, you know, fighting and busting open the road warrior or the, the horseman and the midnight express and the blah, blah, blah. And then it's like the WWF was just too slick at that point. And it, there was a wink that the road warriors really weren't, the road warriors, like there was a wink that nobody else was really who they were up there. They had to be some entertainment value to it, whether the puppet or whatever the fuck. It was just like the, they were doomed from the start. Yeah, they took the edge off them because they also, yeah, it's a minor thing you would think, but they went from wearing black to wearing red with black. The shoulder pads all of a sudden were red. The, yeah. The tights were red. And, you know, it's a minor thing in the general scheme of things, but they go from being the road warriors wearing all black and killing guys to the Legion of Doom with all red. Yeah. I, I just... And, and they looked so clean then. Yeah, they did. Uh, that was... it's And it's the same thing with... Um, oh, God, with Vader. Vader got over everywhere except the WWF because he was a monster beating the shit out of people and, you know, his eyeball was hanging out in fucking Tokyo Dome. That... It, it, Vince never got him and, you know, then Michaels and him finished that off but vince never got him to begin with and and he wasn't ever presented as a real out of control beast it's it's hard to give the impression that anybody's out of control in the wwf which is why that really you know dx was kind of out of control in a goofy way yeah i never know what they're gonna do but it was a lot of it was silly but Austin's the only guy that's ever been out of control, out of control that the people believed in and said, well, they're, they're not even happy. He's doing this shit. That's why he drew all the money. Elsewise there's it's, it's almost impossible to look real in that environment because it's too big budget looking great shot. Well produced, manipulated, choreographed, homogenized, whatever the fuck. Our next question, Jim, sent in the corny drive through at gmail.com from Tad, the Boston Quarantine Boy. There's another thing. I don't want to see a wrestling match with a guy named Kip, and I don't think I want to see one with a guy named Tad. Jim. Hello, Tad. I'm sorry. Is Vince a cool guy? <laughs> what do you consider cool? Could you see yourself ever in any era of the business sitting down and having a drink or a burger or whatever, just hanging out with Vince, just two guys shooting the shit. Well, that's the thing. Vince can be fun and entertaining when you are with him on a personal basis. Yes. Um, I can't see myself sitting down having a burger with him I, because I've done that before. I've sat down, I've had a burger. He was eating a turkey sandwich with mustard, low fat mustard, you know, um, I've sat down and had chicken fingers with him while he was eating a turkey sandwich with low fat mustard. Uh, Vince is not anybody that just shoots the shit. There has to be a reason for the conversation. There has to be, there's something he's always working. He doesn't shoot shit. He, he talks about work and then does work. So, you know, I mean, obviously when you're having conversations or things come up, when you're riding in a fucking car three hours or whatever, he can be, you know, entertaining in, in that respect, but it's not like he's just somebody that just hangs out with people. Back to the question. Oh. Is Vince cool? 
Well, is <laughs> some of him is, uh, and some of him is crazy, and some of him is an evil asshole. He can be, but it, and we've talked about it. There's no way to really describe it, except he, to him, the whole thing, business is business. He will just say, okay, fine, cut them, pal. We need to please the stockholders, make stock look good, you know, blah, blah, blah. So fire these guys. And then, you know, the next time he sees them, hey, how are you, pal? I was just business. You know, sorry your family was out in the street. He did, you know, and he does good things for people. Every once in a he'd hear of somebody that needed something and he'd send them money or he'd help them out or whatever. And he's kept a lot of guys that were loyal to his dad. He he's taken care of the guys that were loyal to his dad better than most of the people that have been loyal to him. Um uh, it's you never know. He's very charming. Like I said, he and Trump are a lot alike. If Trump was witty and eloquent and articulate and intelligent and, you know, had any positive qualities, there's a lot of, you know, Vince has a lot of Trump, but he's he blunts it with some of the good stuff. Well, on that topic, we got a lot of questions about Vince seemingly this week. Next question was sent in the corny drive through at gmail.com. From Red Spiral Ray. Jim, what, did, what did you just say? Red Spiral Ray. Spiral Ray. Red Spiral Ray. Red Spiral Ray. Jim. Ray, Red's his first name. Spiral is his middle name, and, and Ray is his last name. There's something going on here. Jim, with all the stories you've told about him and how you've said he's insane, do you hate Vince McMahon? Do you like him? Or are you indifferent to the rich weirdo? <laughs> no, well, I don't. <laughs> the rich weirdo. I don't hate him. Um, he's at, at various times, he's not been my favorite person. But see, here's the thing. You allow yourself to excuse Vince because generally except at the very top when when you get bad news it comes from someone else besides Vince or he allows someone else like you know if, if, Laurinaitis was my problem in the relationship with OVW and the WWE because Laurinaitis was treating us like a fucking storage closet but Vince allowed it to happen because when Vince is done with you and I don't mean to say it like, even like that when you cannot uh, from a, a period serve Vince's purpose as well as someone else can then he will immediately go to someone else uh, and then he'll do the same thing later on. I don't hate him. There's been many times I was quite peeved at him, but he somehow he has that Teflon where you can't just fully want to choke him by the neck because his interactions with you are never violent or confrontational somehow. But, you know, he's done a lot of great things for me. And he's also pissed me off highly. So, it's not that I, I, what, how was it phrased? I just don't care either way about the fucking. Are you indifferent to the rich? I, I'm, I'm not indifferent. I'm, I'm at this point, I'm like, Vince is a guy that is, is unique and fascinating and you can never understand and you can't really love him and you can't really hate him because if you fall in love with him sooner or later, he's going to fuck you around and then it's going to be worse, but you can't hate him because he's, Anytime you've known him, he's done some good shit for you. So it's 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 weird with him. While you were up there, who was the guy who would get the maddest at Vince? Oh gosh, um, well, I probably me. Uh, not not mad at him personally, but mad about the fucking creative because nobody else, everybody. Certain people would pitch shit, and you know you'd have people who'd have uh, Jr. would be honest and blunt with him, uh, but once he had decided to do something, then everybody else just rolled over with it. But if it really drove me crazy, I'd probably try a little bit longer than everybody else. But you know, nobody just came out openly in front of a lot of people and you know, fuck it, except for and then then this was behind closed doors, but except for all the fucking main event assholes that he tolerated like Nash and Hall and Michaels was giving him more trouble than fucking, you know, anybody else, everybody else put together. Did Bruce ever voice frustration with Vince? Um, no, 
<laughs> um, to Vince, definitely not. To me, no, not really. He just kind of, that's Vince. Or, well, Corny, Vince likes this, or Corny Vince thinks this, or whatever. Like, that was the problem I always had with Bruce. I've said before, I said, just at least acknowledge that I'm working with you. Don't tell me this is sports entertainment, it's wrestling. We'll call it sports entertainment because you and I have agreed to work, but you know I'm in on it. I'm not going to fucking, I will work as long as you give me the, the, the respect of letting me know that you know that I know that we're working. This is not real. We're not telling the truth. But Bruce couldn't ever break down and, and say, well, no, this is the way it is, Corny. It's a WWF way or whatever the fuck. So, you know, I'm sure he'd get frustrated at the number of times that we had to tear shit up and start over again because Vince changed his mind, but he would never actively say, why the fuck will he just not do this and leave us alone? Well, Jim, we got several questions on Twitter and via email about someone who was cut after the experience went up. So what do you think about him being laid off? But also, what do you think in general about Chris Hero slash Cassius oh, Ono? I <clears throat> Well, I mean, at this point, I'm not sure because I haven't seen Chris. In a, nobody's seen Chris in a while. Do they ever book him? I believe uh, he was what? with NXT UK. <clears throat> okay, so he's been in England? Well, I guess he likes England, though. He's, he's spent a lot of time over there. But um, I didn't mean to knock England, but I'm not going to want to fucking get signed to developmental and then move to a different country, to be quite honest with you. But I, I was heartbroken when Hero and Claudio Cesaro, Claudio Casignoli, when they signed to go to the WWE in 2011, Sinclair had just bought Ring of Honor. The kings of wrestling, Hero and Claudio, are my favorite fucking heel tag team in the world. I was loving their matches. They could have a great match with the Briscoes, then they'd go out and have a completely different kind of match with Davey Richards and Eddie Edwards. Just fucking a tremendous tag team. And Hero had worked with Claudio and 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 trained him in a lot of cases and, and brought him along. And they were a great team. And I wanted to sign them for the first round of the Sinclair contracts. But since their deals were up and they knew that there was interest. And so they talked and they wanted to make the jump. <laughs> and honestly, you know, I knew at the time what the fucking deal was going to be. They were going to get there and they were never going to have another tag team match together because they didn't want to start tag teams, keep tag teams together. They wanted Claudio because his fucking physique was fantastic and his size and instantly that was going to catch everybody's eye. And I figured Chris would be lost in obscurity and developmental because he was having great matches, but he didn't have a great looking physique and they weren't going to see what the fuck was going on. The people in developmental, I mean, they weren't going to fucking get it. And the prophecy came true. They never had another match as a team. They liked Cesaro and moved him up to the main roster, and Chris was down there in developmental for two years and left, right? Then he comes back to developmental, what, three or four years ago, and signs again, and now, apparently, I guess what they've been doing is using him to have good matches with the guys because he has great matches with everybody, and so they signed him and sent him to another country to have great matches with people that they're going to fucking use, but they've never used Chris Hero. And to, to top it all off, I was right about Claudio. They l fell in love with his physique and blah, blah, blah. And I think for a while he was on the Triple H's good side or whatever. And then they've, they've kind of buried him because he, he, I saw him a few years ago. He was more over and presented in a more prominent position than what I've seen lately. And his reaction from the fans bore that out. And now he's in the fucking thing where he's one of Sami Zayn's flunkies. And it's fucking nine years ago that he signed. So, yeah, I loved the Kings of Wrestling. I loved watching those tag team matches. They could... If they'd have kept them together and then brought the revival in, we'd be talking about a whole different level of tag team wrestling right now. Cause those guys together would have been insane. But anyway, so actually I wish they'd just let him get back to his fucking name. Cassius. Oh no, that's the stupidest fucking name. 
I've ever heard in my life. I'm, I'm, hopefully now they'll let him get back to his fucking name, and hopefully he still is interested enough to to wrestle with, once all this is over with and there is wrestling again and go somewhere else where he can be appreciated more. Our next question, Jim, sent in to corny drive through at gmail.com from Steve Van Etten. Jim Ross has stated that when Muda was in WCW, he advocated for him to be the heavyweight champion as a babyface and was quickly shot down by the rest of the booking committee. What are your thoughts about Muda as a babyface champion during his WCW run? Well, that that's that's true, but partially true. And it's not like JR is trying to omit anything. Uh, but he did advocate for him to be the ba- a babyface and to even be the champion. There were other people on the booking committee um, at the time that wanted to switch Moo to babyface. JR had had the idea. I think he probably pitched it to Hurd. Hurd liked it because Muda was getting over as <clears> – <throat> heels didn't get cheered back then that often, but Muda was getting cheered because he's doing the moonsault and he's doing the flashy moves. And even though he was in Gary Hart's stable, he was the cool one. And, I mean, it goes back to 15 years before, Bruce Lee. Muda doing all those cool moves and having the face paint and doing the moonsault and all that stuff – he's going to get over as a baby face. And so we heard then, because I remember Flair saying, well, they want to switch Muda baby face. And I could see that. And I, I even said, you know, a comic book could be involved in this. As, you know, with Turner Broadcasting's connections, Muda could be a, a superhero kind of fucking guy with a comic book or whatever the fuck. I can see the kids liking him. Kevin Sullivan didn't have a problem with it. The story that I heard at the time was that Gary Hart talked Muda out of it, which led to some consternation um, uh, with the office and Gary because Gary wanted to stay with Muda, obviously. Gary may have legitimately believed that it'd be bad for Muda to switch babyface, but uh, the office perception was that it was Gary figured it'd be bad for Gary for Muda to switch babyface, and we're mad they talked him out of it. And then about that same time, that's where the the deal happened at Starcade, the round robin tournament where they beat him four times in one night. And that's when Muda got homesick and went back to Japan and has done quite well for himself since then uh, in, in Japan and probably enjoyed it better. But I think it was just, you know, he was over there, he's starting to get over, but then people, his manager's telling him something, but the bookers are telling him something else. His command of English was not strong at that point in time to begin with. And then, you know, he starts getting beat. And then I think, you know, he probably just, it was time to go home. He'd, he'd, he'd had publicity. This just came up on the most recent episode of John Arezzi's Pro Wrestling Spotlight Then and Now. Uh, available at pwspod.com or wherever you find your favorite podcast. Last week, we talked about the week before with Steve Beverly. This is the February 11th, 1990 episode. So this is the Sunday after the Tuesday Clash, Clash 10, Corpus Christi. And Muda obviously got over big time as a babyface in that match at the end of the show, partially because Flair and the Andersons had turned heel earlier in the night on Sting. Right. And then uh, John talks to Dave Meltzer on this episode, and Dave says Muda no-showed every match he had after that event. That was his last night, and then he didn't show up. But the rumor was that the NWA was going to talk with Muda and see what they could do. John brought up, and when I asked him where he thought he may have heard this, we narrowed it down to possibly Paul Heyman, because he was talking to Paul at the time, even though Paul wasn't there. And Paul was talking to people there. But John said he had heard that maybe Muda was told to come home by New Japan because New Japan was so upset at that point with NWA slash WCW because of Flair pulling out of the Tokyo Dome show, which caused them to go to Giant Baba. I mean, that's a big move to go to Baba. Well, yeah. Say, hey, yeah. work with us. That they may have been upset about Flair being pulled out of that show, that they pulled Muda back. And Dave said, well, you know, Muda actually was very close with Sakaguchi to the point where a lot of the wrestlers over there would call him Sakaguchi's boy and, you know, rib him about that. So potentially there is something there. Anything you've ever heard about that? Uh, You know, I don't, well, 
I haven't heard anything about that, and it it does make sense that that's a thing that could have happened, but we probably wouldn't have heard about it because they didn't want to fucking broadcast it. They probably, if they did, they probably just called Muda and said, come on, we're pissed. Uh, yeah, because he, he had never no-showed anything up to that point in time, and then all of a sudden, between Starcade and, and that... Uh, uh, that clash is not even two months and you know, shit's just going South, but a lot of shit was going South at that point in time. Yeah. You know, the other interesting thing, and I never thought of it this way, but when talking about the sting injury, Meltzer said, and again, this is February 11th, 1990. This is fresh. Everything had just happened. They hadn't even announced firmly yet that Luger was going to be in the match. They, you hadn't even (laughs) announced yet that Luger was going to be in the match. But Dave said, and I never thought of it this way that he thought that, they did the horseman turn on Sting too early at that point in time, at least because the baby face single side was so light. You know, you had the Steiners and tag teams. Pillman was being put into a tag team with Tom Zink. Other than Sting and Flair, there really weren't a lot of top tier baby faces in WCW at that time. And as soon as you do that turn and then Sting gets hurt, you're kind of screwed. I mean, you have yeah. to turn Luger. Well, but also Flair hated being a baby face. And Flair never wanted to be a babyface, and Flair was always looking for a way to turn back. <clears throat> and for long term, I can't blame him. But uh, you know, he had been put in that position with the funk thing, and that drew, and it and it got over. But he was like us after after the program with Funk. Flair was like the Midnight Express after the program with the original Midnight. We were babyfaces just looking for a reason to switch back because there was no reason for us to be babyfaces anymore. So he uh, he may have rushed it a little bit, but he you know he wanted to. Oh, and I'll say one more thing about Muda being a babyface champion. I would not have taken the step of putting the belt on him, just because he's he couldn't do promos, and as a babyface, he couldn't have a manager, and as an attraction like that, he really didn't need. You needed your world champion to be able to speak. You needed your world champion to be able be able to get in personal issues and have. You know, the Sting, Luger, Flair, broader appeal. Muda could have been, for lack of a better term, like Hacksaw Duggan in Mid-South. He was the baby face that was over enough he didn't need the belt for a long period of time while the champion was Magnum TA or was uh, somebody else, whatever. He was the guy that was just, or an Andre. Muda would have been an attraction without the belt. I wouldn't have put the belt on him, but I had no problem with making him a baby face if that had ever come to pass. Two final questions here this week, Jim. This was sent in the corny drive through at gmail.com from David in Stark, Reno. Stark, Reno? What? That's what it says here. Stark dash Reno. I don't know. Well, it's David in Reno, and he's taking off on Charlie in Starkville, Mississippi. Ah, okay. See, I'll... I'll, By the way, it worked. He got his question on the air. Yeah, I'll, I'll figure these things out for you. You're a little slow on the uptake. Shane Douglas talked about a rib concerning Sweet Stanfield, Beautiful Bobby, and Sting on Crockett's G1. It was based on two things Jim Cornette fears, flying and knives. Do you recall this event, which was described as culminating in a work stabbing? Oh, good God, yes. One of the things, see, Bobby Eaton would find things at these stores we'd stop at on the side of the road, convenience stores or markets or whatever, you know, like fake dog vomit, just add water or, you know, the fucking, uh, the, the fake cigarette that shoots water in your face or the, you know, I've told the story about the glass breaking hammer that we've, that we found and played a rib on Stan. And so he's got the gimmick knife. It, it goes back into the, the uh, handle. So, you know, it looks like a, a movie knife. When you stab somebody, it looks like it's gone all the way in because, you know, it goes back, at the the blade goes into the handle is what I'm trying to say. You're getting this, aren't you, Brian Last? I do, yes. Okay, so anyway, I hate fucking knives. People are jacking around with them. I don't want to get fucking stabbed. I'd rather actually get shot at than stabbed, you know. So Bobby and Stan have the knife on the plane and I'm sitting in between them and they're passing it back and forth and they're being pretty cavalier with it and waving it around. And it's like, I can't really get a good look at it because they're moving it around, but they're fucking foisted with it. I'm like, you guys are going to hurt yourselves. Be careful with that fucking thing. And just then I think it was Bobby got Stan 
but or maybe Stan got Bobby. My God, at this point, I've, it's been 30 years ago. But whoever had the knife tripped over something as they were getting up to hand it back and fell forward into the seat of the other one and stabbed him. I'm like, ah, oh, shit. And then I realized, wait a minute, there's no fucking blood. And they busted out laughing. But for a minute, my butthole puckered up. Um, but yeah, Shane was, was there in the, uh, in, in, on the plane watching all this happenstance go on. Which was, I hate it when they, when they ribbed me about knives or bugs. Undertaker was with us that time. We were driving to a WCW TV. That's when he was Mean Mark. WCW TV somewhere in Alabama. My God, was it? It may have. It was a smaller town. May have been Gadsden, Athens, something like that, at some college gym. And we stop on a side of the road at this convenience store, and we all get in and get a drink, right? And we come back, and we've got a rented Lincoln Continental. I think Stan was driving. Mark's in the front seat. No. Um, Bobby still had a driver's license at that point in time. Bobby was driving. Mark's in the front seat. Stan's in the back next to me. I'm behind Mark in the back seat. And as we get, it's just out in the country, right? This little store says we get back in the car. As soon as I sit down in the seat and slam the door, I look at fucking Stan and he's giving me that look like he's looking over my shoulder and he's seen something that shocks him. And I turn and look over my left shoulder he has found this goddamn bug that looks, its it wingspan is six inches across. And somewhere or another, he has safety pinned or taped this thing right to the fucking seat right next to my head. So I turn around and come face to face with David Hedison in the fucking fly, right? <laughs> ah! And I fucking throw the door open. I grab the handle and I put, and I throw the door open and start to get out, but I've pushed it so hard that it bows back, it bounces back, and as I'm getting out, it hits me in the fucking head and knocks me back into the goddamn back seat. Now I kick the goddamn door open with both feet because I'm pissed, and I try to get out, and it bounces back on me again. Now I get out, and I grab this door, and I'm literally trying to break the door off of the rental car off the fucking hinges. I motherfuck this fucking, I'm slamming it, and I'm breaking it back. And fucking Stan's dying laughing, and Bobby's dying laughing, and Undertaker's looking like, I just asked for a ride from these fucking guys. What the fuck is going on? And they did every once in a while, you'd find a dead bug surreptitiously arranged somewhere around my area. You know, on this topic real quick, I don't know why this has come up again. We must have talked about it on this show like three years ago. But all of a sudden, there's been a wave of questions coming in. I'll read one of them here. This was sent to corny drive through at gmail.com from James Taylor. Not that one. Oh, I've got a friend. I just watched a Kevin Nash shoot interview where he stated he put frogs in the pockets of one of your jackets <laughs> and Sean Waltman had smashed them against a wall. My question is, did you know who did it? And what was your reaction when you realized your jacket was messed with? I like you said, we talked about this a couple of years ago. It comes up every once in a while. It's on a shoot interview. Maybe people have been watching YouTube because they've been quarantined. Their story is that they stopped at a, a pet shop and bought a bunch of frogs and put the frogs in a pocket of my coat and then smashed it against the shower walls or whatever and figured hilarity would ensue. I at, at, at a WWF TV taping or show somewhere of some description. I've never, actually, I never used my jacket pockets for almost anything, unless it was like a blade or if I was going out with a finish, I'm going to throw powder or whatever. But just walking around, I never used my suit jacket pockets for anything. But I never have found frogs, especially multiple frogs, in my pockets. If I didn't <laughs> find them and sent it to the dry cleaners, I was never informed from a dry cleaner. By the way, we found 16 fucking frogs in your pocket and we cleaned <laughs> them out for you. I've, I've never gotten a, a, a jacket back from the cleaners and saw residue where they could not clean out the fucking remaining brain droppings of a bunch of smashed frogs. So, and they seem so fucking convinced that it happened. I'm at this point wondering if they got somebody else's fucking suit jacket and thought they had 
I don't know. I, or maybe it's just a good story that they wanted to do and decided, well, fuck it. We'll tell it because nobody's going to, you know, say we didn't, except I'm saying they didn't because I never found them. So it rip backfired. For the record, you don't like bugs. You have any issue with frogs? I know I like frogs. I have frogs and turtles and tortoises I used to play with all the time when I was a kid. Go to the lake back here behind the house and go and, and play with the tortoises and the frogs. Frogs are <laughs> frogs are fine. <laughs> Didn't expect that. I don't I don't have a problem with I don't like snakes and I don't like fucking bugs. All right. Frogs well. are okay. Frogs don't bite you. Now those goddamn snapping turtles. They make good soup, but they will bite your fucking dick off. Well, on that note, our final question this week. And where else are you going to hear in podcasting land, ladies and gentlemen, to be aware, beware of snapping turtles because they will bite your fucking dick off? This is an off-topic question sent to Cordy Drive through at gmail.com from John Fell in Baltimore. Finally! What, has John been excommunicated? Has he been exiled? Has he had heat? Is there heat? I can feel it. It's not scolding, but it's there. Why have you not been providing folks with more questions from John Fell in Baltimore, who is the assistant deputy grand poobah of the Baltimore chapter of the cult of Cornette? I think he's been doing a smart baby face thing. You let Charlie from Starkville come in. He's not getting over as well as the previous baby face. And now he's returning to the territory. Could be that, but here's his. Question. He came. He, he went away and learned a new hole. He's the assistant deputy. Who's the deputy? I can't go into that. That 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 high up, it's classified. There's, I have. A, I there's, have a, there's certain <laughs> there's certain things you have to do to get that high up. We can't go into detail. Of I have a question about your comic book collection. In addition to Marvel and DC, did you also buy books from the other publishers like Charlton, Dell, and Gold Key? If so, what titles did you collect? And out of your collection, what is your most prized comic books? Oh, God. Well, yeah, I, as you would expect, I got everything, especially if it was old. If I could find it at the flea market, it was old. I got everything. All the gold keys, the Charltons, the, the fucking uh, Dells. When I could, you know, the Dell was, especially those 50s Dells, because they were publishing 40s and 50s, they were publishing the Disney books. So those uh, sometimes hard to find in high grade because all the kids wadded them up and stuck them in their back pockets. But I was a completist. When I was a kid, I thought, well, at some point, sometime, I'll have one of every comic book that's ever been printed. Because I was a fucking kid, and I've got the OCD even then. Now, it just wasn't diagnosed. Then I came to realize, well, that would not be possible even if I was Bill Gates. So I would have said, up until about three years ago, my most prized comic was my Amazing Fantasy fifteen. But I, as, as was publicized at the time, I sold that and turned that into my brand new front fence and stone columns. Uh, but that would have been my most prized book. Right now, actually, it wouldn't be considered a, a, a rare book, but probably my favorite one now just because it's the first superhero book that I remember buying off the stands would be Tales to Astonish 101, which was the, the, with the next issue, it became the Incredible Hulk, this 1968 series, 102. But I actually, I believe that is the first Marvel superhero book that I bought off the stands, and I've still got it. Were you ever into EC Comics or Mad Magazine, actually? Well, I, I like Mad Magazine. As a matter of fact, I have about two or three boxes of Mad Magazines going back to the early 60s. Um... But EC Comics, I was not because those were the comic books that were too expensive and almost impossible to get when I was a kid. When You could buy, at the time, because it still was the Silver Age, you could buy Silver Age Marvels for 50 cents and a fucking dollar. And, and you know, when I first started collecting Fantastic Four number one, a good price for an average red copy was 15 or $20. I paid $25 for my Amazing Fantasy 15. In night, actually, my mother did in 1973 because it was a birthday present. And I got 25 grand for it 40 years later. Um, but the EC comics, because they were, this was the late 60s, early 70s, they were from the early and mid 50s. The older people that had graduated college and gotten jobs and had a little money 
but remember them plus the pre the uh, pre comics code stuff and ECW or ECW. They probably that weighed on Heyman's mind as well when he was naming it. But EC Comics was known as the, the you know the the people that went too far with the violence and the gore and the whatever. So that was they were more collectible and they cost a ton of money. And since there weren't any around anymore, I didn't collect them currently. So I wasn't going to just go on this back issue crusade and and I didn't have the money to spend anyway. So I got everything, but it was primarily uh, Silver Age stuff and 50 stuff that I could get cheap at the flea market. And then I started picking up a few select Golden Age comics when I could and could get a deal on it because they were still the same superheroes. Marvel had had the Submariner and Human Torch and Captain America. And, you know, DC had still had Superman and Batman and et cetera. So, you know, every once in a while I would, I would locate one of those. I had a coverless Wonder Woman number one uh, at, at one time. And I had Batman number 16, which was the first appearance of Alfred. But half the oh, cover wow. was torn. Yeah, but half the cover was torn off. Uh, so, you know, that's the only, the only really nice Golden Age comic that I ever got and paid money for was once again, it was a Christmas present again. And when I was like 13, you know, world's finest comics, Superman and Batman. Yeah. The first issue was titled world's best number one. And it was a 96 page comic with a hard uh, or a uh, flat spine 1941 or two, I believe. And my mom got it for Christmas for me. It was a hundred dollars as a most I ever paid for a comic book. hundred dollars when you were 13, hundred dollars when I was 13. Wow. Here's the mistake I made in the, the late nineties. When I needed some Christmas money, smoky mountain, I took a few of my books that I had nothing else to go with. It weren't, wasn't breaking up a run or whatever. And one of them was world's best number one. And I sold it at the time. That was 20 years later. I sold it for $1,200. But now it would be worth thousands and thousands and thousands. It was like that. And another, my Tales of Suspense 39, the first Iron Man. I sold that in the early 2000s, right before the fucking first movie came out. It was a very fine copy. I got Overstreet Guide for it, which was two grand. And now the Overstreet Guide, fucking 20 years later or whatever, not even 20 years later, is like fucking 12 or 14 grand. So I regretted those decisions. Have you watched any of the Marvel Cinematic Universe movies? I love Robert Downey Jr. as Iron Man. They, they started making so many. I never have time to go to the movies. And if I do watch movies at home, it's generally old black and white movies. So I haven't watched everything and been up to date on all the Avengers and everything else. But I loved the initial Iron Man movies because I liked Robert Downey Jr. I thought he did a great job with it. They're so good. And honestly, I hope you get caught up with the Avengers movies. The last two Avengers movies are two of the greatest movies ever. I know Martin Scorsese says they're not movies. You know, you can't really <laughs> consider them. They're so good and just they're done so well. The only thing that I regret is when you watch them and if you grew up collecting comics or reading comics it's like you know what sucks the x-men aren't here the fantastic four aren't here the submariner isn't here silver surfer isn't here you know there's lots of they include as many as they can but there's a lot of characters that you wish were a part of these films that for well yeah because because their rights they've still got their rights pieced out to different places right the yeah. marvel characters and it hasn't come together well they now the x-men have come together because they bought 20th century fox uh, I, I'm not sure what the status of Fantastic Four or Submariner are, uh, or Silver Surfer. Do you know what the first Marvel movie actually was? The first one. I, I'm sure you're about to tell me. Howard the Duck. That's right. Which was one of the worst movies of all time. <laughs> <laughs> but he makes a cameo in a, a few of the Marvel Cinematic Universe movies. Howard the Duck has short little cameos. Uh, my kids didn't know who he was. I had to explain that's Howard the Duck. He made a really awful movie in 1987 or whatever it was. And the comic book was really awful in what, 1975? Steve Gerber. But hey, and here's the thing. You know, I I go back so long with comic book collecting. I can remember when Fantastic Four was the main event group and Spider-Man was the second in command. 
And then, and then at some point in time, that flip-flopped and Spidey became the guy. But Fantastic Four was the main event in the Marvel Universe. When you were a kid, and obviously things changed really with the the relaunch of the X-Men with Wolverine and Colossus and, you know, different people in the group now, Nightcrawler. But what were the X-Men considered when you were a kid? Did you um, think of them much or were they kind of an afterthought? Well, it kind of went... Uh, Fantastic Four, Spider-Man, and this is probably more just popularity of the book, but fa books, Fantastic Four, Spider-Man, Hulk, Avengers, and then, you know, the individual Avengers and X-Men was kind of in the middle. It And the, actually, when you go back and look, the comic only ran, what, through issue 50 or 60, maybe 70s, 70, no, 70-something, 70 and then went into reruns, yeah. reprints for years because the sales, it just it wasn't there. And then suddenly with the introduction of the new X-Men with uh, that uh, annual number one and what was the giant number, size. giant size number one, and then X-Men 94 was the new, new one, right? Anyway, um they took off, but no X-Men were at one point were canceled and they kept the title. They just did reprints, but so they weren't really the big deal, but I liked them because I liked the whole deal of professor X in the wheelchair with the, you know, telepathic powers. And I liked the original X-Men. You got a guy with wings. You got a guy that fucking freezes shit. You got a guy with fucking laser vision. You got the beast. He was their thing, but see, that's the thing. No pun intended. It was kind of like, <laughs> it was kind of like, well, we came up with a Fantastic Four, but there's five of them. Because think about it. You know, they kind of had all the same, the beast was the thing. You know, the angel could fly and so could Johnny Storm, the human torch. But we had the guy with the x-ray vision instead of the guy with the fucking, or not the x-ray vision, but the laser vision, Cyclops, instead of Mr. Fantastic, who could stray. It, a lot of fucking similarities there. What did I just say? When you want to bring a main event talent in, don't have similarities to underneath talents. I know you were on the road and actively doing so much throughout the 80s, but did you keep up at all with any of the big events like Secret Wars or The Watchmen, which was a big deal, obviously? And is Absolutely nothing. <laughs> Not a thing. I got away from comic books for like fucking 20 years. I still had them all and still have many of them. And then I started reading the Overstreet again, but I never started buying books again when I finally came back home here. All right. Well, with that, we wrap up another episode of the drive through Good hey, question, Hey, I'm only John. one man. I'm only one man. Good question, John. By the way, yes, it was. But I'm only one man, and I can't do everything and have every hobby in the world and be an expert in every field of endeavor. And I can't be an expert in every single orifice. Well, my goal is, once people stop sending you money... <laughs> We can get you to watch Monster Squad and some of the Marvel Cinematic Universe films, and we could do some of those reviews on Patreon. Well, Talk there you topic. go. That'll be fun. I think you'll actually enjoy them, too. Did you like the Devo version of Secret Agent Man? I have not heard that. What? I have not heard that. I'm shocked. We are Devo, D-E-V-O? Yeah. I have, not, I have not heard that. Wow. I'm, I'm kind of blown away that you are not aware of their version of Secret well, ignorance. pardon first, my fucking ignorance. Their first video they ever made, if you ever want to see the weirdest thing ever, the first video Devo ever made before they even had their record contract, which was Secret Agent Man and then Jocko Homo. And it's I've, them. I've seen J Jocko Homo they played on Don Kirshner's rock concert. You have to see this video if you haven't. Just go to YouTube and search for Secret Agent Man Devo. It's just so bizarre that it's lovely it's perfect <laughs> it's, it's lovely it's well, so completely bizarre it's fantastic but with the that, end of another lovely drive through that's right of course you could hear more of jim cornett's drive through and the experience going back to the very beginning by becoming a patron patreon.com slash cornett thank you so much to everyone who has already signed up for the archive tier new episodes go up each and every sunday night Classic episodes going back to 2013. We are now in the spring of 2014, plus other bonus content, patreon.com slash cornet. Of course, you can hear the drive through and the experience wherever you find your favorite podcast or the experience when it debuts each and every Friday, wherever you find your favorite podcast. 
And you can go to YouTube, tinyurl.com slash official corny YouTube, or just go to YouTube and search for Jim Cornette for clips of every episode for the entire episode, as well as various omnibus collections. And thank you to everyone. We have now just gone flying over 100,000, marching towards a million right now. Yeah, what am I going to get fucked out of when we get a million? I didn't get my cake. We just blew right past 100,000, just just blew right past. It didn't stop and say, wait a minute, Cornette needs the cake. We have to provide the cake. It just blew right past it. Once again, the official Jim Cornette YouTube channel. Just go to YouTube and search for Jim Cornette. You can follow Jim on Twitter at the Jim Cornette. Follow me on Twitter at Great Brian Last. You can hear me on the 605 Super Podcast. 605pod.com are available wherever it is that you find your favorite podcast. Cornet's Collectibles at jimcornet.com. No. 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 Don't say those words. Don't plug that website. Leave this there's man alone. To, leave, there's nothing more to see here. Move on. Go on with your lives. Give me a week. Well, until next time, until Friday on the experience for the exalted one of the cult of Cornet, Mr. Jim Cornet. I'm the great Brian Last. Tally ho!